case you don't know me, some of you might not know me here. Uh, I'm Wendy Hall. I'm uh, director of the Web Science Institute, and it's my pleasure and sort of sad duty to introduce Professor Halpin to you tonight. It's wonderful to see such a mix of people here, completely full house. Um, I expect people come in late, and we should have got a bigger lecture theatre. But um, we had to gently persuade Susan to do this. She, in her usual modest way, did not want to make a fuss about leaving. Um, she's been leaving for a while, and now she's actually gone. And uh, <laughs> she seems to be here more than she was before. But that's another whole story. I was trying to remember. I've, I had a day of memories. Um, you know, I'm so old now that I uh, always reflect on what was and what has been and how we got to where we are today. And I see one Professor Pope sitting there. It's the best professor surname in the world. Um, became a professor while we were working together. And I, uh, I have a memory of Cathy sitting next to me at dinner before, long before Web Science, uh, well, before Web Science. Um, but a women's networking dinner, I think. And you said something like, I want to work, Cathy said, I want to work with you. Because uh, we'd been talking, I'd been talking about all the stuff I wanted to do. And she turned up in my office about a week later and said, we're going to work together. And um, that was at, uh, well, probably before, it's hard to remember the chronology, before we got the first Web Science Doctor Training Centre because you were part. Is Les here? Must be. He'll be here in a bit. Oh, mm -hmm. We were talking earlier about how Les's diary is not in the same time what's it of the universe as the rest of us. Anyway, uh, what's, the, what's the expression we had earlier about Les's diary? He thinks he's got one of Hermione's time flowers, but he hasn't. Yes, exactly. <laughs> There's a Harry Potter thing about Les's diary. It has a mind of its own, but it's not the same as Les's. Anyway. Um, so, coming back to that's very web science, so, with Les and, uh, oh, well, Nigel and Tim at the time, uh, we were getting web science going, that's what I told Cathy about, and we, had, we got the first web science uh, DTC, and Cathy, I think, was a day a week on that, you were actually subconded to it for a while, weren't you? And because of that, she brought her friend Susan to come and talk to us. And that was the first time, I think, probably the first time I met you, uh, I may have heard of your work before through Cathy and others, but so we're talking at least 10 years ago here. Yeah. And uh, it was a bit of a culture shock, I think, for both of us, or both groups really. I'm thinking particularly of Susan's culture shock of working with engineers. Mm -hmm. It was quite an eye opener for you, wasn't it? What engineering was like? Mm -hmm. uh, particularly male professors who didn't remember your name. <laughs> There was one. <laughs> because they didn't think you had anything important to say. Well, that was what I took from it. <laughs> um, and now look how you've grown up to influence them. Uh, I, think in well, I was quite grown up then. Yes, I mean, in terms of grown up with engineers. So this is what it's all about. So these two taught me about co-creation. Co sorry, co-construction. This is an eye this was an eye opener to me, this whole idea of the fact that Tim Berners Lee didn't create the web. Alright? <laughs> Kathy used to give the most fabulous lecture on that to the students. Um, because we co created co constructed it. Yes, it was co construct. Yeah, we co because I found co create easy to think about than co construct. And I learnt so much from these people about, they made web science tick. Because before that, you know, we, we knew there was something about people using the web that made it work. But it took the people, the social scientists, that these guys introduced me to, to explain what that was all about. And that has been the essence of web science at Southampton ever since. And as Cathy got dragged off to do the ref and uh, Susan became more and more involved in uh, being an integral part of the Web Science Institute and absolutely firmly involved in the design of um, the second centre of doctoral training in Web Science. She and I personally had our enlightenment when we co-supervised Mark Schuler. Is he here? Uh, <laughs> he is back again, but anyway. That's when I learned about Bourdieu theory, as did Mark, this innocent software engineer who learned about Bourdieu theory 
I'm not sure if I'm even pronouncing it right, but I did find out that this social science stuff is really hard. Right? If you think pure maths PhDs are hard, it's nothing compared to a social science PhD. And having to learn to work together, and as different cultures come together, I just wanted to build stuff and work out theory afterwards. Susan wanted us to do two years of theory before we built anything. Um, so we had to, anyway, Mark got his PhD and, and we've become firm friends. And since then, you know, she's got involved in things like the Dagshaw. I see stuff, you know, really, that's the core of computer science. She's in like dangling in the lion's den going to a Dagshaw. Um, and uh, has published in the CACM as a result, and much, much more than that. But I mean, she's been absolutely essential to what web science is today. And I owe her so much. And now she's gone, and I still think there's, a, there's another universe in which she's still at Southampton. And as she keeps appearing, that, that, that's still sort of reinforcing itself. But now she's firmly at Bristol. She's got her new digital futures future there. Um, and she's going to talk to us today about digital futures, the difference that web science makes. She's still working with us. She will forever be working with us. We'll involve her in all we're doing, and you'll be in our hearts forever. And I will cry at the end, probably. <laughs> Susan. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Um, actually, what I want to talk about today is the future. I want to talk about the future of what I'm going to be doing, but more importantly, I want to talk about the future. The future particularly, the future in general, and the future particularly with regard to how artificial intelligence is going to shape all our futures. Now, I think this is really quite an odd opening. It's an odd opening for an exaugural, because you might well more reasonably expect that I would be talking about the past. And it's an odd opening for a sociologist, because sociologists are generally rather sceptical about the future. We're sceptical about the future because we're only too aware of the failures of some of the founding theorists of sociology, poor old Marx, Weber and Durkheim, the modernist theorists. We're aware of all the ways in which their predictions about the future turned out not to be particularly accurate. And we're also aware, as sociologists of technology, that the outcomes of technological innovation are not predictable, but rather depend on specific applications, on specific uses, and on specific contexts. So not surprisingly then, for those of you who don't know, it's rather more common for sociologists to say that their discipline occupies a time slot that is fairly firmly in the present. Now let me counter these two oddities in reverse order. So my first starting point is that the contingent and undetermined nature of the future is exactly, exactly why sociologists should be involved. Rather than running in the opposite direction because we're concerned about not being able to predict the future, given that we know the future is not determined, it's unsettled, it's uncertain, sociologists should be involved in understanding if and how we might contribute to shaping the future. My second starting point is that we cannot do this on our own, particularly with regard to disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence and all kinds of others that I could name. The future is not made in disciplinary silos, but demands integration of the disciplines right across the academy if we're going to have any kind of meaningful grasp on where we're headed and how we might get there. Building on web science, which is what we've been doing for the last 10 years, is exactly what I'm going to do in this lecture, drawing on all of that past of the decade that Wendy's been describing in order to try and say something about the future. So I promised in my abstract that the lecture would have three parts, and I do really like three-part lists. However, and you'll see that later on in, in the lecture, in fact, my lecture's got four parts, sorry to disappoint you. Um, the lecture's going to start with saying something about problems with futures thinking, why thinking about the future is a problem for sociology and social science in particular. Secondly, I'm going to suggest some principles for thinking about the future that might take us beyond those rather well-worn and well-understood problems. Thirdly, I'm going to say something about how the AI future is imagined now. And lastly, I'm going to talk about how we might do the future differently. 
So let's start with what's wrong with the future. I'm going to start by saying something about the epistemological differences between the disciplines. Wendy alluded to some of the struggles that we've had. Uh, Mark and Les and Nick and others in the room will tell you about that. Any history of the disciplines, if you read around the history of the modern disciplines as they emerged in the, light, in the Enlightenment and beyond, will tell you that the modern disciplines and this rather depressingly familiar hierarchical relationship was deeply shaped by Newtonian physics, which established universal laws, prediction and objectivity. Um, oh, I don't know. Sorry, we'll come back to that which established universal laws, prediction, and objectivity. It probably just underpins it all, Wendy, yeah, I expect. So it I probably was, you know, because yeah. it's before the Enlightenment. Um, <laughs> established these as the gold standards um, of academic knowledge, of all knowledge, in fact. So as new disciplines emerge during the Enlightenment and beyond into the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, claims to legitimacy, claims to being a body of expertise, hinged not only on identifying particular substantive areas, so if you look at the social sciences, it was sociology, politics and economics that said they were the substantive areas of the social sciences, but also on how closely a discipline could align itself with the gold standards um, of universal laws, prediction and objectivity. Now, as sociologists, we have really long... Hello, Les. <laughs> <laughs> You won't be comfy like that. <laughs> I don't think I deserve to be. <laughs> You're on the naughty step. We were talking about you earlier. So as, as sociologists, we have long understood the political strengths of this scientific epistemology. So it seems that the closer a discipline can claim to be to these universal standards, the more power it is able to wield. And we have also understood the scientific weaknesses of this epistemology for knowing the social world. Because what we do is seek to understand the world that people make in interaction with each other, in ongoing ways and dynamic ways, we know that there are no universal context-free explanations for society. Social systems and practices are absolutely bound up with time and space. They shape each other. They're not predictable in a universal laws kind of epistemological way. We also understand that objectivity is impossible. As people who study people, we are already part of the world that we seek to study. We cannot stand apart from it. We are already embedded in it. We're never entirely above the thing that we're studying, and this thing that we're studying is reflexive. People, institutions, governments, they think about the social world. They think about the research and the ideas that are used to represent the social world, and sometimes they change it. So the knowledge that we produce is part and parcel of shaping and changing the world that we seek to study. We cannot stand above it in that classic way that's described historically. And finally, we understand that research is always driven from somewhere. Whether that's by the values of scientists, whether it's by the values of funders or governments. In fact, the Gulbenkian Review of the Social Sciences, which I really encourage you to read, it's fantastic. It was published in 1996. I'd not read it until last year. Uh, included a Nobel Prize winning physicist on the panel, interestingly enough. It concluded that fictive neutrality has become the major obstacle in increasing the truth value of our findings. To put it in a different way, pretending to be neutral when we're studying the social world is actually a higher risk in terms of the quality of the knowledge that we produce than acknowledging where we're coming from and what our relationship is to the social world. So, in response to all of that, sociology has built, and the other social sciences, but I'm a sociologist, has built a diverse and increasingly strong, I would say, repertoire of methods and theories and concepts that enable us to make some strong and actionable claims about the societies that we live in, in the present or the past. Can't go too far back because that's history. Sociology's got the present. 
The second thing that's wrong with the future comes from our understanding of technology, the way that we study technology, and is underpinned by many of those epistemological and methodological positions. And it's this. We challenge technological determinism on the grounds that we know that it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to know when technological innovations happen exactly what the outcomes will be in terms of their social, economic or political impact. As the PhD students, many of you in the room, you know there's a load of different versions of that kind of theoretical position, but I think it's enough to say that when we started web science 10 years ago, that approach, that idea that technologies didn't have a predictable path that they were following, really was one of the things that resonated with Wendy and Les and Mark and the other computer scientists that we started talking to, exactly at a time when they were thinking about the web, which was following this completely unpredicted, inexplicable and uncontrollable evolution. The web was not turning out as people expected it to. Uh, I won't go into this, but that's the first picture ever of the internet, followed by Tim Berners-Lee's um, a memo about the, the well, it wasn't called the World Wide Web, but it was about a global information sharing system. And you can see, you know, the web didn't turn out like anybody thought it would. So this idea that technologies were unpredictable and uncontrollable was something that helped to bind us together in those early days of web science. What was much harder from the start was the question of the future. Because, of course, computer science is much more tied into scientific rationality and epistemology, prediction and objectivity than sociology, which, as I've just said, um, is rather sceptical about those things. But that didn't stop us in our tracks because we had so much to be dealing with in terms of the past and the present that we weren't really too worried about the future. The emergence of data science a bit later, did pose temporarily rather more of a challenge. Um, this is a quote from Chris Anderson. I hate using it because it gives it more publicity, but it's emblematic of the kinds of claims that were made for data science in the early days. I don't know if you can all see it, but basically data science was going to get rid of everything because once you had the data, numbers would speak for themselves. Now, fortunately, there was a pretty swift rowback on those kinds of claims about data science, particularly, and I'm only talking as they refer to the social world. I'm not talking about um, physics or anything else, but in terms of how new forms of data and computational methods were going to impact on our understanding of the social world, even these kinds of evangelists from 2008, 2009, pretty quickly rode back and said, well, actually, you know what? These data are quite interesting. These methods are really interesting to apply to the social world. But without domain expertise, which is what those of us in the social sciences might call politics or sociology or theory or empirical research, they're not going to really deliver in the way that we thought. And all of that underpins the interdisciplinary principles of web science. It actually reasserted, rather than being a problem in the end, once we got through this kind of ridiculous hype, it underscored what we were doing with web science. So far from replacing the social sciences, new forms of data, computational methods should be combined with sociological and other forms of domain expertise. The question remains and has still not been resolved, how do we harness that towards the future? In order to think about how we do that, I'm going to say that we need to think differently about the future. I've got three key points I want to make about how we should think differently about the future. Now, I am not the first social scientist or sociologist to say this. So for all that sociologists are skeptical about the future, there have been some eminent sociologists who've done some work on the future. What's really interesting is that they're highly fragmented. fragmented. None of them refer to each other, which I find bizarre. And I think this may partly explain their failure to stick. So although we've got these eminent people writing about the future in sociology, they are not, it hasn't been taken up widely in sociology, and I think their perspectives have not widely been taken up in a broader public policy or industry sense. And that's something that needs to change. So there's three things I want to say about the future, which in many ways are completely obvious, but ru really rub against that notion of prediction um, and scientific epistemology. The first one is that the future is made from the past and the present. It's made from social and political relations, institutional arrangements, material infrastructures, and also cultural narratives. All of these are deeply shaped by the past. They're remade in the present before they are cast towards the future. 
The future cannot be conjured out of nothing. The future is made from the past and the present. The future will emerge in complex interactions of a socio-technical system, social and human actors, at the interplay of a diverse range of contexts, situations, relationships, and so on. Wherever we are coming from, technological evangelism or social utopianism, neither of those will overcome this. Okay? We have to think about the future in terms of socio-technical assemblages of this kind. So Sheila Jasanoff, who's one of these people who's written quite a bit about this, she says, we must pay attention to socio-technical thickness. It's a slightly uncomfortable phrase, but it captures what I'm talking about. To think about, and this is Ruth Levitas, who's also written about that, think about how the future might be played out in practice through the design of institutions and the actual processes of everyday life, as well as through the processes of technical innovation. That's the first point. The second point... How we imagine the future now contributes to how the future will be made. The future, in a padgerized terms, Aaron Apadurai is another one of these writers, an anthropologist, but I'm borrowing him for sociology at the moment. The future is a cultural fact, he says. For Jasanoff, this is captured in the idea of the socio-technical imaginary. So she talks about the emergence of strong ideas collectively held, institutionally stabilised and politically performed visions of desirable futures that enrol networks, they enrol governments, industry, academics, and together this comes to appear as though that is the future. This imaginary comes to look like the future because it's represented in these coherent ways by powerful actors that come to look like unmediated representations of the social body's norms and values. And so Jasanoff, to cut a long story short, describes this process as a linear one, and I'm going to come back to that, where we start with origins, where possible futures are conjured up by powerful actors who fire up the imaginary of what the future is going to look like with all these new technologies. We go from origins through to a process of embedding, where those powerful ideas are attached to particular projects, particular instances of those ideas. We go through possibly some process of resistance, where there's a bit of a fight back on that, until in the end there's a kind of consensual, um, global consensus around what a new phase of socio-technical imaginary might look like. So that's the second thing I want you to bear in mind. And the third or final point I want to make is that who or what owns the future is an exercise of power, given what I've just said. Dominant imaginaries, the socio-technical imaginaries that circulate around us shape what is thinkable, what can be thought about the future, or to put it more dramatically, um, is a colonisation, operate as a colonisation of the future. How the future is presented matters. Who talks about the future matters. And who has the capacity to think about the future is a question of privilege, it's a question of inequality, and it's a question of social justice. There can be no doubt that the ability to think about the future, to fire up the imaginary, to embed that imaginary in projects, to see it through in the way that Jasanoff describes, is not something everyone can do. It takes economic assets, cultural assets, to site Bourdieu, uh, and social assets as well. But a Apadurai, um, in this book that I really recommend the future as cultural fact to you, Writing in a different context, he's writing about housing activists in Mumbai, actually, but he offers us some examples, I can't go into them now, of how those who are right at the bottom of the heap manage to mobilise their assets and dreams, he says, against, this is really important, against the politics of probability, the probability was their lives would carry on being pretty rubbish and possibly get worse, into the politics of possibility, and the, how that managed to change the future for the slum dwellers that he was working with. Whether or not you see the relevance to this particular context, his point is that the future, what makes the future hard to predict, also opens up possibilities for unforeseen change. We shouldn't think, oh, the future's just set, there's nothing we can do about it. Because it's not determined, there is always the possibility for change the possibility for alternative futures and the possibility of futures that, as Jasanov says, that people would sooner inhabit. 
So those are my three points. That's the social theory. I now want to talk about AI. And I want to talk about the present futures of AI. I want to talk a little bit about how we understand what the AI future looks like through the dominant representations that we see at the moment. To begin with, how we even think about the future of AI is shaped by historical narratives. We can trace those narratives back to the Greeks, back to the Victorians, and into the labs of the 20th century computer scientists. Throughout all of this, narratives of AI flip between utopia and dystopia. Accompanied in the past 50 years for AI by this cycle of AI booms and busts, of AI winters um, over that period of time. And here we are again. The winter is over. Last year, uh, Wired, kind of authoritative in this space, I guess, announced that AI was now the era's most critical competition, the flywheel for economic and social transformation with all the major technological giant companies, the global corporate companies, betting their companies on it. So, for Intel, AI promises to transform more than the way we do business, it's going to touch every corner of society. For Microsoft, AI is going to solve the world's most pressing problems. <coughs> for IBM, it's not just going to solve the world's most difficult problems of today, it's going to solve all the difficult problems of tomorrow as well. And for Google, AI is one of the most important things humanity is working on, more profound than electricity or fire. <laughs> of course, this has its dystopian counterpoints, uh, leading the charge, in particular, Elon Musk, um, to remind you, the billionaire who's seeking to develop the rocket technology to colonize Mars, leading the charge against what he calls humanity's biggest existential threat, in a well-publicized spat with Mark Zuckerberg recently. Now, all of these claims fire up the imaginary. Okay? That's what they're doing. They're firing up the imaginary in terms of Jasmine's origins. But as Ian Bogus points out, when figures like Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk talk about artificial intelligence, they aren't really talking about AI, not as the software and the hardware and robots and things. They're talking about words and ideas. They're framing their individual and corporate hopes and dreams and strategies. The narrative may be driven by certainty. This will do this. This is going to happen. But there is almost no attention whatsoever to socio-technical thickness, to the actual technical and social actors, relationships, etc., that will need to be brought together to make anything like this AI future happen. At least in part, I think, this must be immensely irritating for AI scientists. Um, I'm not one, so I don't know. I meant to ask a few before I came, but I think it must be very irritating. And it makes AI all too easy for social scientists to just dismiss, because it sounds ridiculous. But we shouldn't dismiss it. We dismiss this at our peril. And I think what we need to do instead is to clear out of the way all of this certainty and determinism. Let's get rid of all of that certainty and determinism. Even then, the term AI doesn't really help. Whilst good old-fashioned AI dominates the imaginary, invoking ideas of superhuman intelligence that's going to run the world and take over and all of these, a singularity and all of this stuff, that's not really where we are at the moment in terms of AI. Um, I think this must be why it's quite irritating for AI scientists. Uh, where we are really is in terms largely, not solely, but largely of increasingly complex, sophisticated and clever forms of machine learning with increasingly large and diverse and difficult to manage um, new forms of data worked through mathematical models for prediction um, in particular. So thinking just about social data, this has had its successes. So all of that machine learning and AI, it's had its successes. I mean, Spotify is quite good at making recommender systems. Siri can understand what we want often when we talk to her. Um, and a variety of, of other quite um, interesting successes. But it also has its limits. I'm only talking about social research here, please bear in mind. It also has its limits, both in terms of the kinds of questions that we can ask kinds of social questions that we can ask, and also at a deeper methodological level. And I was really fascinated to find this um, 
talk recently, I guess some of the computer scientists in the room may, may know it. This was a talk given by Ali Rahimi, who's a machine learning computer scientist, and he was receiving a rather prestigious, I believe, award. And at this award, he likened machine learning not to electricity or fire, but to alchemy. I think perhaps it was quite controversial. Um, alchemy remi uh, alchemy. Rahimi reminds us that alchemy worked sometimes. There's some great successes, actually, from alchemy. Um, we didn't know why, but it did work sometimes. And often, it was really, really wrong. He says, this is OK if you're building a photo-sharing website, but we're beyond that now. He says, I would like to live in a society whose systems are built on verifiable, rigorous, thorough knowledge and not on alchemy. Mm. Now, I think he's thinking of a different direction to me, in terms of a different set of problems and a different set of solutions. But for me, what that means is that we build our knowledge on a range of sources that are appropriate to the things that we're studying and the questions that we're asking, mm. using appropriate concepts, methods, theories, and so on, including new forms of data, including computational methods and machine learning, but not replacing social sciences with either those data or methods. The third thing I want to say is that the impact of AI will depend on the uses to which it's put. Okay? There's nothing inevitable about what those uses will be. So far, for all the hype, and I kid you not, for all the hype that machine learning will eradicate inequality and end climate change, the actual uses to which it's being put are a little bit more mundane. Google, for example, slide seamlessly and without any sense of irony from fire and electricity to that's why we built Google Assistant, which allows you to have a natural conversation between you and Google. It's the one assistant that's ready to help you through your day. Great, I'm not knocking it, it could be really useful, but it's not eradicating inequality or ending climate change at the moment. Um, repeatedly, what we see at this superficial level, and I'm not pointing this at the door of the academic AI people at all, for whom I think this must be really irritating, repeatedly what we see is unreflexive assumptions about who the future is for, highly individualised, highly uncontextualised, market-driven, largely Western, mobilising really serious challenges, for example, um, the ageing populations in Western societies, towards justifying highly technical projects. We've got to have autonomous vehicles, because what about the old people? Hmm, I'm not sure. You know, they, we need to pick that, pull that apart a little bit. This tells us something about whose presence are being directed towards the future. Who is directing their presence towards the future? Um, I'm glad Meredith Broussard said this. I don't know that I would go quite so far. But she says most such ideas come from a small group of elites who have been imagining a misunderstanding the interplay between technology and society since the 1950s, drowning out social ideas and making it impossible to have a proper conversation. And this one I absolutely agree with because it comes from Wendy Hall, who says, for the good of society, we cannot allow our world to be organised by learning algorithms whose creators are overwhelmingly dominated by one gender, ethnicity, age or culture. So, where do we go from there? As we stand at the threshold, undoubtedly, of some major new technical possibilities, my pitch here is that we should think about doing futures differently. We should be more ambitious, more ambitious than Google Assistant, maybe not quite as ambitious as someone else more ambitious than digital assistants and autom autom autonomous vehicles, more ambitious in seeking to drive those AI futures with a range of voices, not just settling for the same old voices. I know that this sounds really idealistic, but I think we have an opportunity right now. I think the time is now to change this. The time is now for a number of reasons, but in general, because of the politicization, both of the data and the methods that underpin the latest round of AI. So if the latest round of AI is driven by machine learning, machine learning is driven by the creation of massive new forms of data sets and applying algorithmic decision making to those data sets. And both of those things have been highly politicized. All we need to think about is Snowden or Cambridge Analytica 
or algorithmic bias and discrimination. These are socialized issues now. These are in the public domain and the public has something to say about them. There are serious moves in government to do something, in the academy and yes, even in industry to think about what this means for our AI futures. The Royal Society has written two quite interesting reports recognizing the spectres of winter's past. The concern, and comparing it with genetically modified crops, actually, the concern that if the public debate goes a certain way, then funding for AI, which has promised to deliver the world, may dry up again, and that that's not what anybody wants to happen. So what do we do about that? Well, ethics training is a start. This is something that the Royal Society recommends. Um, holding AI scientists accountable to a range of ethical standards, particularly around um, privacy, around anonymity, around data security, is really important. And it's a minimalist approach. Okay? It's, the, it's the baseline, it's the bottom floor. It treats the social challenges of AI as a set of technical competencies, suggests that somehow all of these challenges, if you just teach AI scientists to behave ethically, everything will be okay. It's sufficient, but it's not enough. It doesn't yet address questions about whose futures are driving the development of AI or how AI will emerge in these socio-technical assemblages. So perhaps for this reason, social scientists and others have been invited increasingly into some prestigious projects like Turing, for example, to address the ethical, legal and social implications of AI. Again, that's a good thing. But I have to say that the terms of engagement for that are often rather narrow. I don't mean Turing particularly. Um, and I need to put... This is borrowed from somewhere and I haven't put the source on. Um, where technology, ethics and sociologists tend to be treated in this way. So technology's got all the promise. Ethics is tick box and sociologists are the people who say, no, you can't do stuff. Now, we've got to get better. We've got to get better than that. How intentional that positioning is, I can't say. And what I can say is that ethics will not stay neatly in that imagined place because this is not everything that ethics is. Ethics stretches way beyond, looking at Kieran, way beyond moral philosophy, beyond rights and wrongs at the level of sovereign individuals, for some people at least, towards considerations of care, of fairness, of equality and of the kind of society that we might want to live in. This means much more than treating people as privacy regulators or data points, okay? These are really big, powerful, important social questions. And this is really my major message. We must think not only about human futures in the context of rapidly changing technology, but also about technology futures in the context of a complex, unequal, and fragile society. This you will be pleased to see I've got Donna Haraway in here. This, where we are now, ties computer scientists, social scientists, political scientists and others together. Whether we like it or not, we have no choice other than to work together in the current situation. Donna Haraway is writing about climate change. I think the same applies to the digital age and to where we are with digital innovation. She criticises disciplinary biases and she calls on us to move both beyond comic faith and techno fixes, glad she said it, and the fatalism of critique, which is what sociologists are jolly good at, that kind of critique which is, oh no, it's all too late and it's terrible and it's all just going to be the same anyway, so there's no point in doing anything about it. And she says what we must do is focus on the more serious and lively task of making the future. So what do we do about that? How do we make the future differently? Um, I don't know, but I've got a few ideas, and this is what I hope to be working on. There's a huge amount more thinking to be done about this. I'm going to start again at the kind of bottom level. Uh, there's a stream of research under the heading of AI for good. At present, the AI imaginary is dominated by commercial interests and to some extent by government interests. Wouldn't it be interesting if 
we tried to drive AI by other kinds of interests. Um, sorry, it's very hard to read, but this is with great thanks to Fabian Gandon, who is one of our colleagues who we did the dark stool with, who has come up with this great big long list of ways in which AI might be harnessed towards good things, like bursting filter bubbles, or automatically reading T's and C's for us, or monitoring the cookies on websites when we use them, doing things for social good. Deliberative debate online, where's Matt? It's the kind of thing it might also be involved in. I think that's great. I think we should do all of this. Um, but these initiatives are narrow. They are redolent of a certain kind of technological um, solutionism. But they are really, really worth doing. The second thing we might do, kind of moving up a level, is to think about harnessing speculative design towards a deeper sociological consideration of AI futures. So speculative design, thank you to Faranak, who introduced me to this, who's sitting in the middle at the back there, is a form of critical design, but it's not, really, it's not really about creating operational systems. It's about thinking about what the future of certain kinds of technologies would be, and if the future of those technologies were going to be different, how would you redesign them? How would you design technologies for different kinds of social futures? To put it in more sociological terms, sorry, but it's about thinking about future socio-technical assemblages. This begins from the recognition right from the start that any technology requires context. PhD students and ex-PhD students beware, technologies on their own do nothing. It's the combination of technologies and people that changes worlds. And we need to be thinking in that way. That's my favourite ever quote from Donna Haraway, by the way. This encourages us then to think in a systematic way about the different paths through which technologies might come into use and where the challenges might be and where the opportunities might lie. This is resonant, resonant, resonant with Ruth Levitas's work, which I commend to you, who talks about utopia as method. Where would we like to be and what would it take in order to get us there? Or Eric Olin Wright, who any of you know his work, he very sadly died last week. Um, who talks about real utopias, actually imagining what would it really mean, what would it actually look like institutionally, politically, socially, economically, as well as technologically, to make a different kind of future. So as Dunn and Raby say, who've written this book on speculative everything, the future is not a destination, but a medium for imaginative thought, through which we might look at futures differently, from different standpoints. And third and finally, another in my list of three, in order for this to be meaningful, this has to be participatory. We must democratise the future. Speculative design could be one way of doing it, but we need a much broader futures project that enables us to take into account a much wider range of voices. We need to start with really strong and sustainable understandings of where we all are now. And we need to think about what works well, what doesn't work well, what would need to change. What are the possible futures for the AI applications that are being banded around at the moment? And what would it take to get there? If autonomous vehicles really are going to secure a, social a socially integrated and enjoyable old age for people, for all people, what would have to change in order for that to happen, rather than it just to be for a few privileged people? Robots for the elderly. A lot of the talk about robotics at the moment is about we're going to use robots to care for old people. What would actually have to happen in order for that to be a meaningful, valuable and useful choice? And is it any of those things? So for that, we have to move beyond the usual suspects. We have to diversify the vision of the common good and empower participation in the future. Now, that's really difficult because futures thinking is a privilege, as I mentioned right at the beginning. But we need to find ways of doing it better and at least not accepting how it is at the moment. Um, bringing people back in, not just as users or consumers. I've spoken to lots of people recently who said, oh, no, I talk to people. I, I do A-B testing or, or I discover whether people are resistant to technologies or not. That's, that's not what I mean. I mean something very different from that. And John Urry, in his book, um, What is the Future, which was his last book as well, the future seems to be killing them all off, um, 
he suggested scenario planning. I think that's one way forward, but he didn't talk about how we might harness new forms of data or computational methods in that. And I think absolutely we should be harnessing those data and methods in whatever way we can. If that helps us to democratise the future, if it helps us to think about what alternative futures might look like. So what I'm saying in short, and I'm going to stop in a minute, is that we should think collectively across the social and computational sciences and with in-depth and long-term public engagement about what we want, how we might get there, and what happens if we fail. I just want to say a few words by way of conclusion. I've got three conclusions, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, the elephant in the room. If there is an elephant in the room, it's this. AI futures are dominated by global tech companies driven by profit. Whatever we do, this is an unequal landscape. Right? We're not going to wrest power from Google overnight. Google employees, I can't remember, you know, but some huge proportion of all the AI PhD <laughs> graduates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whatever we do, we're on an unequal landscape. It is now as important as it always was to trace how power works, to trace the operation of power, and to be analytical at least, and probably critical for my part about that as well. But doing that strengthens our understanding of the digital economy and it may also open up spaces for action. Spaces where we can work with, alongside or against the corporate giants and enable us to grasp what might be possible and what might be desirable. This is what Donna Haraway calls developing a responsibility in the digital age. She's talking about climate change, I'm talking about the digital age. And I think in brief critique of Jasanoff, I think this is more than resistance. She has this very linear path where origins, embedding, resistance, global, imaginary. I think we have to believe that there's more possibility here, that we're not on a linear path, and that there really are possibilities for disruption, um, or at least the potential for that. <coughs> the second conclusion I want to make is that in-depth, deep expertise in established disciplines is absolutely critical for this. I have never thought that we should replace established disciplines because there has to come on, I'm a sociologist, there has to be a division of labour, right? We can't all be experts in everything. But what is absolutely critical is finding the places where we can intersect, work with each other, and where we will reshape each other because the digital age is unsettling the way that we think. We can't think in the same way that we used to. And that's what web science, you know, Wendy talked about this and me working with engineers and her working with Borgia. It shapes the way we think. And we have to find new ways of doing that. Um, I am the first to say that collaboration is difficult. I'm not going to wash too much in public, but I am the first to say that collaboration is difficult. We know about the different starting points Wendy alluded to. And that's before we get onto the structured barriers that make it really difficult for us to work together. Um, in some universities, they have systems where PhD students' fees can only be paid in one faculty, would you believe? makes it really, really difficult to get supervisors <laughs> in more than one faculty. We have systems where workload models disincentivize people teaching across faculties. One faculty is an internal market. Why would you let your staff go and teach in another faculty? Then we get on to REF, which judges us in terms of single disciplines, largely. We get on to journal publishers, which don't necessarily know what to do with interdisciplinary articles. Never mind the disciplinary hierarchies and the power struggles, which absolutely still exist. As an organisational sociologist, that's what I was for many years, and as a lifelong academic, I understand intellectually and practically where the differences are. And as a web scientist, I know how important it is to try and overcome them. Thirdly, and finally, I just want to say some thank yous. This might be where I get upset, but probably not, because <laughs> I'm good at hiding things. I'm a control freak, as you all know. Um, I want to say some thank yous. I want to say thank you to Pauline and Cathy and Alison, who started this Futures Thinking in many ways with the Work Futures Research Centre and Rebecca sitting there. I want to say thank you to Cathy again, and to Wendy, and to Les, and to Mark, with whom this adventure called Web Science unfolded. And it was a rocky road in some ways, but it was an adventure, and you've become my dearest friends. Thank you so much. More recently, I'd like to say thank you to Tom, and Tom, and Elena, and Sophie, I can't see you, Sophie, um, who 
have been part of the journey more recently, as well as to my colleagues in social sciences, so to Pauline again, and to Rebecca, and to Bindi, and Zilka, and to Pam, Anita, Craig, Matt, Agnesi, I don't think she's here, for embracing web science, for really taking it on and working with it and exploiting it for the things that were useful. I'd like to say thank you to the web science students, many of whom are in the room. I have learnt so much from my web science students um, and continue to do so. And I'd like to say thank you to Susan, to Jane, Susan, to Jane, to Nicola and to Sam, who not only keep the road on the show, but are just the voice of reason and good sense. And I'm so grateful to you all for that. I've often said um, it's more nerve-wracking, look at this paper clip, it's more nerve-wracking to give uh, a talk to a very small number of your colleagues than it is to a large uh, room of strangers because we share those histories and we share those commitments and we're friends and we have very meaningful, it matters in a different kind of way. And this is a pretty large group of colleagues and friends, um, so I'm very, very grateful to you all for coming. Um, thank you. I welcome your comments and your questions. That's it. I just want to make one point, which really uh, Susan exemplified a lot. She was talking about thinking differently about the future. When we were trying to think about what to call web science, um, uh, Tim Wellesley wanted to call it philosophical engineering, because he found physics at Oxford where it was called natural philosophy. And the future and would have been different. <laughs> <laughs> and, he was, and then also we really, really, really wanted to call it psychohistory, which, which was in fact what you were talking about there. And, you know, is, is it possible, partly, is it possible to actually know enough about what people will do en masse to determine the future at all? And, uh, but we thought people would, not enough people would be science fiction readers to understand what psychohistory was. And so we came up with web science for good or bad. As I always say, there's two things I hate about web science. One is web and the other is science. <laughs> anyway, we've had a wonderful lecture about it. I've got questions. I can say that. Let's defer to the audience. Questions or comments to Susan on what she's saying. Stefan. I knew. <laughs> Hi, Stefan. So, so tell people who you Thank are. Thank you very much for your talk. Beautiful. Um, to which extent is your utopia part specific to AI? Oh, I mean, not, at all. not Not really, not because that was my feeling. That, but then I, I have to. I, I don't quite understand how whatever is exactly going on in AI is really important, or whether it's really more these words that are brought forward rather than the actual technology. No, it's really important, and that's what's changing the way that we think. You know, Ruth Levitt has got to talk at all about technology, actually, in her book on Utopia, and doesn't have a, wouldn't have a handle on it at all, which is fine. You know, that's not what she's trying to do. But if we're really thinking about the ways in which disruptive technology is going to shape the future. Absolutely, it's not just. I think my mission in web science, from one of the things that changed most quickly that Wendy was alluding to, was that recognition that you know social constructionism just doesn't cut it. You know, we can't just say all oh, social technologies are just socially constructed, so there can be anything. There can't be anything. You know, and we really that that's why we have to work together because there has to be some serious and proper understanding of what actually is possible, what directions of travel actually are happening, what the near, you know, the, the short, medium term futures might be in, in technical senses as well as in social economic sense. I'm sorry if that didn't come across for me, but absolutely. And it isn't just about AI. And you know actually the bigger project would be to think about the range of disruptive technologies that are on the planet scales at the moment, what their relationship to each, with each other, what the kind of time scales are. We've got a Julian, um, one of the PhD students who I'm working with is Martin, and sort of talking about researching the future of the quantum internet. You know, that's a whole other thing that we've got going on. And high performance networks is a whole other thing that we might have going on. Um, robotics, swarm robotics, and some of these things. So, you know, that's a bit scary to think about all of those at once. So, AI was. Um, 
something I've been thinking about a bit, a topic of things that seems appropriate to talk. I think she means imaginary in that very broad sense. So when you say imaginary is a not very good way of thinking about the future, I'd ask you about what other ways might there be. Well, most things to do with the scale and ambition of the future you're sketching. Yeah. You might kind of think, okay, let's aim for technological change. So uh, rather than aiming for disruptive transformation of technology, change, which is the EPSLC notion of what technological change is, you might say, let's think about how we can make change incremental, reversible where possible, mm -hmm. and rigorously yeah. yeah. So that kind of less yeah. small range. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, I think that the, the scoping of all of this, you know, it, it, it can be scoped from the very particular and the very near future to the, to the very gen generic and the very far future. And I think I agree with all of that, um, but different kinds of, and also that there are different kinds of problems. Now, so if what you're interested in is, is traffic management of your city, then there can be all sorts of primitive ways in which real-time data can be used to do predictive work that might help to control traffic lights or whatever. You know, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trashing any of that. That's just not the kind of social questions that I was thinking about. So I, I agree with you that that kind of idea of particular engineering and the topic change the way this is done. And I think, I think there's more to be thought through on that. I think really mapping all of that out would be a really good thing to do. Thank you. Bye. Uh, DCS set up something called Future Worlds. Yes. Um, and the way, you know, as far as students at this university think, I mean, it's an incubator and people invest in it. And it's, it's incremental in the sense that you test your assumptions, will people pay for it, will you make money out of it? And that's the way the future is being built, whether, you, whether we like it or not. I mean, we can sit and think about how it would be nicer to, you know, to do things differently. I mean, the government puts money in the industrial strategy fund, it's sort of about the economy. So, where does that fit in? So do you think we should just sit back and... No, no, I don't. I mean, I've got, I, 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 I'm a Turing fellow, and I've got a project called uh, AI and Inclusion, which is missing from the whole of Turing. Mm. Um, I know. And I've been working to do with accessibility all my life, and nobody's interested in, in funding research in it or, or. Mm. So what I'm, I'm, But I'm, would you say that around the agenda of accessibility, would you say nothing's changed in your life? Um, things have changed. Uh, a lot of... You've got a lot of lip service, you've got a lot of laws which people disregard, you've got a lot of, you know. Um, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, you've got the, the research in terms of this thing, but how are you going to change what actually happens day to day? Well, that's the, know, the, stu the students are, you know, setting up companies and working out mm. how to use the technology and gener generally it's, you know, how do we make money? Yeah. Not how we change the world. Yeah. I mean, Zuckerberg and look at how look at how futures worlds of future worlds has been set up in this university. Yeah. 
Sorry? Look at how future worlds have been set up in this university. I don't really want to get into that right now, but it, it's got quite a narrow remit. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I'm um, just saying that's the way... Well, let's try and challenge that. Let's try and do something different. Yes, it's idealistic. Yes, it's ambitious. But what's the alternative? Do you have to have them? really exciting, especially when you, when you talk about democratizing future. I thought, that's a wonderful idea in itself. But then, history is against us in that sense. <laughs> history has been made up by those who have brought the rule, mm -hmm. the, the rule and rule. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, why and how do you think, especially first, why, do you think this time we could democratize the future? And secondly, how do you think we could about it because again and again history has in the throughout mm -hmm. since I don't know, since history has been written we have seen these ideas percolate to the society and then fail. Well, first of all I'd say I'd, I'd say the same thing as this mind, which is these think nothing has changed over history in terms of democracy and the inclusion in terms of diversity and so I would say yes things have happened. I'd say I'm very glad that you know I'm glad that I'm alive now, not 200 years ago. Yeah, no, I'm taking a much narrower view from the AI lens as you are looking at it. And I'm thinking from the AI perspective, the leading thought yeah. within the AI perspective is a, a very siloed thought mm -hmm. right now. I, see, I really see change. Okay, so, so partly the change is coming around the big problem to do with data ethics and surveillance and security and trust. I'm sorry, I'm sorry James, but you know, the way it must be really irritating to change the next thing. Trust. It must be really irritating to you. So this word's always mobilised as the answer, but it's mobilised in a really unthought out kind of way. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons I think we've got an opportunity. And I think re reading the Royal Society report is just really interesting because like, we don't want to go into another AI world. We need to do it better this time. We need to do something. And that's why I mentioned ethics, even though as a sociologist that's important, but it is quite a kind of narrow you know, baseline thing. But it's important as a way to start. Talking to industry, um, talking to the government, and I know these just small examples, right? But they want a different way of thinking. They, they know that the projects they've been working on may bring them ruin. Okay? They are worried about what the regulatory environment is going to be. They're worried about how people will think about things. So they want better ways of doing it. Maybe because they're lovely, or maybe because they're protecting their business and their business models for the future. And they're feeling really uncertain about it. And I can have a conversation um, not working with but a big percentage of the recently and also with a big national uh, global telecommunications company. And they are thinking about it. Now, I'm not naive enough to think this is going to bring about a revolution, you know, what that might mean. Yeah. But rather than just saying, oh, it's going to be impossible, we have to try and do something to chip away in some kind of way. And, and the history actually is full of examples of, of where the trade union has chipped away in some kind of way. Well, I can see lots of hands so. going up, and we're going to take um, one more from you, because no, 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 I'm really happy to yeah. talk to you about that. There's a time. Yeah, you have okay. your hand up. Sorry, guys. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's all that is just really brief. Um, <laughs> one, one of this, so I said, but while I was listening to the question with your answer, I think there is so much in social movement studies, which is looking at, yeah. How do we bring about change can and challenge power relations and so on? And there's so much interest in social movement studies in technology now. So I think there is so much happening that just does what you are composing. So thank you for this very lovely inspiring talk. So I think there well, is are on that way. So was a question. It was a good uh, five V, but I'm just going to say, what about China? <laughs> yeah, well, what about China? Absolutely. And I mean, that's. I thought when you talk about the elephant in the room, I think that's it's China. China. <laughs> Not capitalism anymore. They have set themselves to be the best in AI by 2030, mm. and they're well on the way, and they have yeah. completely different social values yeah. to us. And talking about Julian's work on the quantum internet, you know, that's, yeah, absolutely. But he's going out to China, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> we have to finish there because um, uh, people have to uh, go and relieve childminders and. Uh, go and eat and uh, marking or whatever uh, <laughs> uh, we have to do. Um, uh, this is uh, au revoir uh, to Susan. Um, she's, uh, as I said, she will always be with us in our hearts and she will be back uh, as part of projects and 
she came to our CDT advisory board today, so now she's an external member yeah. of um, our boards and committees, and uh, she goes with uh, websites in her, her core of her being now, uh, and will be an evangelist uh, for us, and we'll see a whole new group spring up at Bristol, no doubt. But I just want to say again, thank you for a wonderful talk, but also thank you for just being you and for having been such a great part of shaping what we've done here. So thank you, everyone, again. Thank you.